Welcome everyone. I want to welcome you to our first 2015 Creative Mornings Oakland. We found one of the best speakers to interpret this theme of ugly. We're going to get this party started. I want to introduce our speaker this morning. Lucky Viv is a really amazing gallery, really flipping the script on what galleries are supposed to be, how artists show their work, and they've been doing all kinds of amazing murals throughout town, collaborating with local artists and artists that are internationally renowned. I want to introduce to you Lucky Vive part owner, Sorrel. Thanks, Yvonne. Lucky Vive Gallery, we're, uh, we're right here in Oakland. Uh, we're a contemporary urban art gallery that really bridges the gap between street art and, uh, and fine art. And uh, what that means exactly uh, to me is that we, we show a lot of street artists in our gallery. We show a lot of graffiti artists. We do murals. We do public art uh, installations. And we really give these artists that a lot of people see as ugly and just bombing the city. Uh, we show that they have amazing illustrative talent and a, and a, and a beautiful power that deserves to be seen in, in galleries. Before I go too much into the, the gallery, I just want to give you a little history on myself. I grew up in a really creative household. My dad was an artist. My mom was a dancer and a performer. So I had a lot of creative influences in my life. And I used to draw with my dad every day. We would just sit and draw. That's, that's just what we did. And uh, when I turned about 13, I, I stopped drawing and just hanging out with my friends all the time. Didn't really, didn't really care about it any mu much anymore, which was kind of sad. When I graduated high school, I, uh, I got a job at the stock exchange in San Francisco as a, as a runner, which is just entry level, you know, bottom of the barrel job. I worked my way up. I was, I was really good. I had the knack for the numbers. And... Uh, in a short period of time, went from runner to broker, floor broker, which was quite an accomplishment for someone my age with no college degree. And uh, I, I was really proud of myself. It was kind of unheard of for, for someone my, uh, as young as I was to, to do that. <clears throat> and uh, everyone was really proud of me. I was proud of myself, and I was making a lot of money, and it was a, a great experience. As time went on, I started to feel more and more just kind of disenfranchised with what I was doing. I was just kind of part of this money system. I didn't really care about the financial market that much, but I was making a lot of money and everyone was telling me, oh, you're the man, you got this great job, you know, you've made it, da da da. And uh, part of me felt like, yeah, you know, I did, but I wasn't really all that happy in what I was doing. You know, it was kind of a, an ugly existence, really. One day on the floor, uh, another broker that I knew uh, had a heart attack and, and he, was, he was dying right there on the floor. And it was really dramatic. Everyone had to keep working around him. You know, no one could stop because in New York, they don't know he's having a heart attack. You know, and trading has to go on. It's this really intense environment. And this guy's dying. You know, he's dying right there on the floor in front of us. And I remember just thinking, like, this is just so ugly. This is just the most horrible thing I've ever seen. We can't stop. We can't even help him. We just have to keep doing what we're doing. And uh, I, the, the symbolism of, of life and, and death and greed and commerce and all that really started to catch up with me. And I, I just felt like, oh, man, what, what am I doing? You know, why am I doing this? But, uh, you know, I was accustomed to a certain lifestyle, so I, I kept working. And about two months later, another trader that I knew who was a really nice guy killed himself. He, he committed suicide. He was down on his account or whatever, and, and that was his, his way out. And at that point, I, I just had enough. I, I just felt like I don't, I don't want this life anymore, you know. So, so I quit. Everyone was shocked. Like, how, how could I quit this great job? And uh, the, the people who knew me well, like my mom, she knew that it wasn't good for me. So she was happy for me to leave. But most everybody else was like, why, why would you do that? You know, why would you leave this, this great opportunity? But, but I didn't want it anymore. I wanted to do something for myself. I wanted to be my own boss and, and move on with my life. So that's what I did. But that experience gave me this unshakable confidence in myself. I had accomplished this. I could do anything. So I felt like, okay, let me, uh, let me start my own thing and, and be my own boss. And my best friend at the time, Malik, he had been on uh, MTV's Real World. And he had come back, and, and he was, like, famous, you know. And so uh, we, we decided to start this clothing line. We were like, oh, yeah, we're going to be like these, these fashion guys, you know. We're going we're gonna to be these fashion moguls and blah, blah, blah. 
I thought I was like this cunning, you know, business guy. Well, it didn't take long to realize we had no idea what we were doing. Totally flopped. We were just out to lunch. We, had, we really had no idea what we were doing. But sometimes you have to just try things, you know. You have, to, you have to just try to make it happen. Through a series of events, we were able to get some screen printing equipment. And we thought, hey, we can take production into our own hands and, and make our own stuff. And, and that'll kind of solve some of our problems. Well, he had a lot of connections through his, you know, fame or whatever. And uh, he, he got us this really big order from Zappos.com, the big shoe distributor, right out the gate. And so we, we started printing these, these contracts, and we, and we became this contract printing company. And we just started doing more and more, and our own uh, ideas of designing and all that just kind of went to the side, and we became this, this printing company. And, uh, and it took off, and we built it up, and we got more presses and more equipment, and, and we turned it into this thing, and, and we were proud of it, and, and we made it happen. And, and people were telling me, oh, man, you, you, know, you did it again, and you, you're your own boss now, and that's great. And, and it was good, and I, I was really proud of that. I was proud of the fact that we, we had built this company, and, and that felt good to me. But as time went on, I started to feel like I'm just kind of like printing shirts. I'm just running this factory. I'm not really into it. My heart's not really into it. As time went on, I, I just started to feel more and more unenthusiastic about it. I, I really didn't believe in it all that much anymore. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you are small business owners. You, you know that when you, you, when you have a small business, you don't really get any days off. You don't get to take any time off. You take it home with you. You know, I'm going home at night. Me and my wife are talking about invoices and, and customers at the dinner table. You know, it's kind of it's kind of sad. So, I wanted to to do something else. And so we we built this this retail space and this gallery space in the, in the front of the print shop. And, and at the time, I was thinking uh, th this is going to be uh, a cool way for me to be involved in the art scene, or we're going to have these retail ventures, and, and I'll feel better about it. And uh, at that time, uh, Michael Broberg walks in the door, who's, who's sitting right here. So he walks in the door, and he's like, I want to run an art space in Oakland. And, uh, and I was like, oh, you know, great. You know, wow. You know, uh, but I don't have a job for you. You know, the gallery didn't make any money. So uh, he started interning, and he, he wanted to just run the space. And so we, we kind of had some smaller events and did some things, and, and, and that was cool. But we weren't really, like, all that involved in the art scene. We were just kind of doing these, these events. Well, he really started digging into the scene and, and building real relationships and, and, and building bridges with artists and, and, and taking me along and, and showing me what was really going on. And I was really fascinated with, uh, with the art and the talent in Oakland. I was blown away. It was just so amazing to me. And uh, <clears throat> at, at the print shop, uh, occasionally artists would come in and, and want to do these art tees and these collaborations. And, and I always had a fun time doing that. And it kind of brought me back to my own art. And uh, I, I told myself when I would do these, these art projects, focus on the art and the money will come. I, I've told myself that like every week. I, I don't even know why. At the time, I thought it meant, you know, focus on your graphic design and, and your shirts and stuff and, and you'll feel better about yourself. And, and, but I, I really didn't know what it meant. I just, for some reason, kept, kept telling myself, focus on the art and the money will come. Well, we kept uh, moving forward, and, and the more I worked with Mike, the more I saw, like, wow, there's just, like, amazing things going on. And uh, we went to visit uh, this amazing artist, Cannon Dill. We go to his studio, and he's painting this, this painting on the floor in, on his socks, and he's, he's pouring coffee on the, on the painting and, and brushing it in and, and hitting it with ink and, and spray paint while swirling the coffee around and doing this amazing piece and, and I was just blown away like it kind of redefined how, what art was how you created it it opened my eyes I was used to just pens and pencils and I didn't realize that there was so much more to it and so much more that was that was happening in Oakland and so I, I just knew that I, I really wanted to do this I really wanted to be involved in the art scene and so I came back to Malik uh, after a while, and, and I just said, look, man, I don't want to do this print shop anymore. I really, I really don't want to do it. I just want to focus on the gallery. And he probably thought I was crazy because the gallery didn't make any money, <laughs> but the print shop did. Uh, but I just I didn't care anymore. I'd spent so many years chasing money that I wanted to do something that I cared about. I was really just tired of, like, trying to make more money to, and, and that would take me to the next thing, you know, or if I, if I made this much money, it would open these doors. Well, it kind of never happened like that. It's like you just keep chasing more and more money. And so I just, I just wanted to be done. I just wanted to be out. So we, we made an agreement. We made a buyout agreement. 
he took the print shop, I, I took a settlement and the gallery. We still share the space today. Uh, the print shop's in the back, the, the gallery's in the front, and, uh, and we went our separate ways. And so Mike was all about the gallery, and so me and him formed a partnership, and, uh, and, we, and we moved forward with the gallery. And, and that's how we got our start. And at that time, we didn't really have a, a name or an identity, really. We just knew that we wanted to do what we wanted to do. And so uh, he, he texted me at like 1 in the morning, Lucky Vive, you know. And, and I'm, I'm like, Lucky Vive, you know, what, what does that mean? And <laughs> it meant uh, who, who lives is kind of the direct translation. But it has, it has other meanings. It's from like the French Revolution or, or some old time. And uh, <laughs> meaning whose side are you on or on alert? It had a lot of meaning for us. It had a lot of double meaning. So, so I liked it a lot. And we decided that's, that's what we were going to be. And, uh, and we moved forward. And our, our mission was really to, uh, to showcase the local talent here in Oakland, the amazing things that they were doing. Uh, our favorite artists were the street artists and the graffiti artists, but they weren't really showing anywhere. They weren't getting shows and gallery. You couldn't just go to a gallery and see some of the amazing stuff that was going on. And so we wanted to be that place for these artists to really showcase their work, uh, but also not have to try to conform to what other galleries were telling them that they had to do in order to sell their works. We wanted to just give them an open space to really be who they were. Ever since the, the 80s, I think uh, galleries have been seen as kind of these, these institutions of greed and exploitation, especially by uh, graffiti artists and, and street artists. And so we really wanted to change that perception. Uh, we, we wanted to be an artist first gallery. We wanted to, to take the whole profit and loss discussion kind of out of the forefront of the conversation and, and really take care of the artists and, and be all about integrity and about our relationships and, and how these relationships really carry us through. And that, that was kind of the cornerstone of our whole business. And we felt like if we change the perception of how they feel about galleries, it'll open the doors for all of us, that we, that we all have a place in the, the art scene. And uh, us as a gallery and them as artists, we can all work together and, uh, and really make this happen. We wanted to do it in a way that was true to the artist. And so we wanted to incorporate the, the street element into our gallery itself. And so we, we let them do all kinds of things. We have, a, we have a mural wall within our gallery, so they can show their illustrative work, but they can still paint a wall and kind of get down how they're used to getting down. So we let them just do whatever they want to do. You want to paint the walls? Paint all the walls. You want to build out a bunch of wood stuff in there and, and incorporate it into your art? Do that. You, know? you want to make a log cabin scene with your work? We're all for it. You, know, you have the freedom to, to do what you want to do. Build a giant installation of colorful boxes, go ahead. So we just, we let them do whatever they wanted to do. We didn't want to limit their expression. We didn't want to try to, we, we were trying to curate the, the show, but we didn't want to force them to do it any kind of way. We want to let them be who they are. And so they, they, they were doing amazing things, like uh, painting in the whole corner like this, which was just brilliant. You know, that's, that's Ken and Dill again. But the amazing thing was, is that every month, three weeks later, you get that. And we got to paint it over. So nothing lasts, you know, we, we all go through life, you know, feeling like we're, we're so important, but we all come and go, and uh, this art comes and goes. We put it up, we enjoy it, and then we paint it right over. And that was kind of part of the allure was you have to come in, you have to see it, you have to experience it, because it's not going to be on the wall somewhere else ever again. It's going to get painted over, and, uh, and that's going to be that. And outside of the gallery, we really wanted to give these artists that we were working with exposure on a, a larger level. And that's kind of what led to us uh, doing our murals. They, they, had, they were already painting in the street. But they weren't doing a lot of uh, legal work. So that, that was our very first mural there. So we, we started talking to property owners and, and business owners and uh, just saying, hey, let, let us paint your wall. We want to do this. And you know, to not too much success. But we started telling people, we'll, we'll do this for free. And when you tell people, I'll do things for free, and they start listening. <laughs> and so they were like, OK, you know, go ahead, paint the wall. So, so we started securing more walls, and, and one led to another, and led to another, and led to another. And, and we've done almost 20 now in the last two years. We were doing so many that people were coming to us and saying, oh, yeah, you're, you guys are like the mural guys. I, I, I've seen your stuff. Uh, you know, you guys are getting paid for that. Well, I had one guy tell us uh, we got 40 grand for that last mural. And I was like, oh, really? Did we? <laughs> because uh, we haven't received a dime 
uh, th these murals cost us money. You know, we, we're buying paint, uh, lifts, scaffolding, Home Depot runs, tarps, you know, everything. But it wasn't about uh, the money. We just wanted to let these artists show what they could do and really express uh, their amazing work. This is our last one with uh, Zio Ziegler in November. They were doing this amazing work sneaking around at night. And we felt like, well, what can they do if in broad daylight with lifts and all the paint they need and, and take all the time that they want? And, and what you get are amazing, iconic pieces uh, like this next one. That's a, a really powerful piece that I think will probably stand for, for 50 years. But what most people don't realize is that that same piece was done by the same guy that did this. IROT on the freeway. You know, you guys probably drove by that on 580 a couple hundred times and were like, ah, oh, this IROT, you know, it's ugly, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which, which, you know, it kind of is. And, and you know, he, I, I won't lie, he's a bit of a vandal, but he's also an amazing, talented artist. And so within the ugliness that we have in the city, there, there's this amazing talent that we just felt really needed to be shown. And the, the thing with the tagging is that it's, it's never really going to stop as long as you have frustrated, angry youth and markers, people are going to be scribbling their names on walls. I mean, that's just a part of life at this point. But w within that ugliness, there's this, this voice that needs to be heard. There's this talent that really needs to be shown. And we wanted to give uh, a platform for these artists to show their talent, that if we give them a venue and a place to show their ability, it gives them a professional identity. It lets them know that there's places they can go to further their careers that's uh, not gonna end, let them end up in jail. The relationships were really the, uh, the, the, the focal point of, of everything we were doing. They, they really became like uh, uh, close friends and, and a close community. And the gallery itself kind of became this, uh, this great community environment where people were coming and um, sharing ideas and, and collaborating on works and uh, expressing themselves. And, and, and we were really, we were really proud of that. You know, we really felt like, hey, uh, th this, is a, this is a great place, a great community of artists that are doing what they want to do. If we treat them with, with honesty and, uh, and integrity, we'll have lasting success with them, even if the money's maybe not there right now. If we focus on the relationships, we can have real lasting success. I mean, I think in the art business, you can, you can cheat people and exploit people, and, and a lot of galleries do that, but you can't really last doing that. So we wanted to really change the, the game in that way and just make it really focused on, on relationships and, and building trust. And uh, over time, uh, all, all of that came together. And, it, and it's amazing how, how, how far uh, relationships and kindness can, you know, can take you in business. Uh, a, a guy I knew from my, my kid's school who I, I thought I had nothing in common with was uh, starting this new uh, revolutionary merchandising uh, company and uh, this, this great new platform. And, and uh, we, we talked and, and were able to secure a partnership agreement with him. And, and it was this new revolutionary way to, uh, to make and produce merchandise. And how they were doing it is uh, you have this 3D modeling where you can just upload your artwork, design it onto to garments and, and uh, merchandise. And then they, they print it on rolls of fabric to pattern and then cut and sew and, and assemble afterwards. So, so design-wise, it was, it was really unlimited in what you could do, which was a, a dream come true for me. So I started working with him and producing all these, these merchandise for the artists. Uh, and it kind of brought me back to uh, how I originally got into this, just wanting to do my own designs and collaborative artwork. And... Uh, and focusing on the art. And, and, and I started to feel really good about that and, and what I was doing with the artists and, and giving them this opportunity to create products that they couldn't normally do. That's an original painting there turned into that shirt right there. And so uh, what was so great about it is that it was brandless. They could all just be their own brand and be their own identity. So we, so we created this new website called brickandcotton.com which is a, an open platform for artists to join and create their own merchandise for their own brand and not have to be tied to some clothing line. And uh, it was a, an amazing opportunity that just fell into our lap through just, just being kind and, and having good relationships. And so everything was really coming full circle for me personally with the, the gallery and uh, the merchandise and all of that. And, and I started to really feel like I was in the right place. You know, I was really at home and, and I was feeling good about myself and, and what I was doing. 
And, uh, you know, the, the reality was that the gallery was a, a really big risk for me. You know, it didn't have uh, a clear product or, or service that could have for sure financial stability. It was just kind of an idea, but I, I knew I wanted it. I knew I wanted to be a part of it. It, it meant a lot to me. And I really cared about these artists and I wanted to help them define where they wanted to go professionally. You have to be willing to take risks to, uh, to succeed. I, I think that's, uh, that, that's just how it is. You have to be willing to uh, take risks to start something that you really believe in. I have this conversation with people all the time and they're like, well, yeah, I wanna, I wanna do something on my own. I wanna start my own thing, but you know, my, my bills and my car and my family and all that, and I totally get it. I mean, we all kind of have those responsibilities that we deal with, but there's an old saying, scared money don't make none. And it's true, you know, you kind of have to be willing to put yourself out there and not afraid to, to try and succeed. And uh, the funny thing about that is, is I feel like um, people who are trying to be more conservative and, and want to do things but are scared, in my opinion, they're actually risking a lot more because what they are risking is their chance to do something fulfilling to them. They're risking the chance to have uh, a life that's f fulfilling to, to, and meaningful to themselves. And that, to me, is, is probably the most important thing uh, you know, that we can have in life. Everyone has the ability to be an entrepreneur, I'm sure all of you are or, or probably will be at some point. And uh, you know, take matters into your own hands. You know, fight for your right to succeed. We, we all can do it, but, but from what I've learned is, is take time. Think about it, you know, think long and hard about what you really want to do, you know, dig deep and, and, and think about what's meaningful to you. Uh, I think in society, there's kind of this, uh, this idea of, of being an entrepreneur just for success, you know, like I, I want to do this thing, I want to find this niche that hasn't been exploited yet and make millions of dollars off of it, and, and you know, that's great. But what happens is there's all these companies and all these things that don't really mean anything to people. I, I think at this point we've got, you know, enough Ubers and in and out burgers and all these things. I think it's time for people to really start trying to invest in themselves and create businesses that really mean something, that are really driven from the heart, because that will really change the, uh, the landscape in, in business. It's obviously, uh, you know, kind of an ugly world out there. I, I think it's time we, we redefine what beauty is through our own businesses. You know, um, I'm, I'm happy now. I'm, I'm broke, but I'm happy. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm drawing at, at night and, and doing my own art again, which feels great, and, and, I'm, and I'm happy. And uh, I'm, I'm finally focused on the art, and uh, I'm just waiting on the money. <laughs> So thank you guys. I appreciate uh, appreciate this.